Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Builder By. We're getting our projector set up, so we're going to come back to our, the screen in just a minute while they're doing that. I'm going to flip over for right quick. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Builder By. We're uh, getting everything set up, finalized, setting up the projector, so we're going to flip back to our little Indians until we get everything squared away with the projector, and then we're going to come back and talk to you about some computer problems, a new browser that we're going to share with you today. And... Uh, these computer problems relate anywhere from power supply to memory to motherboards, plus the new Ryzen machines we've built, which are running fantastic. And, of course, we've been through the Windows Tuesday update issues. We're going to talk about some of that and uh, what's going on with Windows Creators update, some issues that, well, at our hate-love relationship with Microsoft. So stick around. We'll be back at 1 o'clock, which is about 15 minutes. Thanks for joining us. And welcome to Builder Bye. Okay, how are we doing with the projector? Good with that image? Fantastic. Appreciate that. Well, some of the problems I was having with Lou's machine, I have now solved, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, some of the problems were, uh, they were all very real, but my perception on some of those problems changed. Kind of like a doctor, you know, once you... Uh, once you have a problem, you uh, try to affect a cure from the results. Well, you you got to you got to treat the cause, not the symptoms, and it takes time to figure out what that cause is. But Lou's machine is running good now, and it's also running nice and quiet. Of course, Lou built a uh, Ryzen 1700, and remember the issues I told you I was having with the BIOS and all those beeps that were going on, and that was a memory issue. It was a power supply issue. And I thought all the noise we had on Lou's machine was from her video card, because it's an older video card, but I'm using an older video card in my Ryzen machine because I want to see what I can do with just the processor. So after I went through problems with another machine, because the primary machine that I do email with is an FX machine, and it was one of those situations. Do you build a new machine or do you build a new old machine? Well, at the time, I had to build a new old machine because the Ryzen wasn't out yet. So I was about four months before I could get my hands on Horizon. So I built an FX machine. I'm using an older power supply. Why change the power supply? It's been a good power supply. Y'all remember when we used OCZ products? Remember when we used OCZ RAM? OCZ was DDR2. As most all the memory we used for DDR2 was OCZ. OCZ had power supplies. Remember, OCZ bought PC power and cooling, which I didn't like the idea of because PC power and cooling was always my favorite power supply. And then what happens? OCZ got bought. Well, long story short, I had a 850 watt OCZ power supply that went out on me, but I didn't realize at first it was the power supply. I'm chasing ghosts with memory management, PFN, all this kind of stuff that's related to memory. And in the past, when I had a power supply problem, the power supply either worked or it didn't. This would come on, and sometimes Windows would just go poof and randomly reboot. And I'm like, okay, Microsoft, what are you doing to my machine? Once I figure out that they were not the culprit, sometimes it would happen when I was doing something, sometimes it would happen when I didn't. And how we first noticed was that little woman's voice, you've lost internet in the middle of the night. That freaked me out. By the way, I figured out where that's coming from and it was not Killer Networks. It was another application that I didn't realize did audio. So once I realized the power supply was a problem on the main machine, I was a couple of days, had to order a power supply. So it's a good thing I built the Ryzen so I could get the email back up. But in the meantime, I realized the problem I'm having with Lou's machine may be her power supply. So I pulled the lid and looked at the power supply. And I said, hmm, that's an OCZ power supply, which means it's five years old. Because I went back and looked at the Bella Arc file, which I keep on her old computer, to see what's in it. Granted, it doesn't tell me what kind of power supply is in it, but it tells me the date the machine was built when we ran that report. So five years old, I'm thinking, Lou needs a new power supply. But in a new power supply, all those little issues we had disappeared. Machine boots right up. None of those, none of those problems. Now, when you build a new computer, build a new computer. If you think you're going to save some money because you don't need a new power supply, think about how old that sucker is. Now, me personally, from now on, from this day forward, I'm going to write a date on those power supplies so I know when I've used them. Because I typically, like Greg and I were talking, I typically cycle through a lot of components.
But a power supply, if it's a good one, I hang on to it. Case is number one I hang on to. Power supply is number two I hang on. And I've got some old PC power and cooling power supplies that still work, that are at least 10 years old. So when this happened, I just said, hmm, five-year-old power supply, I'm at the end of five years. But in the past, a power supply would either work or it didn't. I remember we had some power supplies back when we were building 486s that just wouldn't turn back on. But when this would come on and off, then it finally just gave up the ghost. It wouldn't come on at all. I said, okay, we've done it. We've got to have a power supply. So fix our power supply, fix lose. Let's get a mic over there on uh, Robert Collier, please. Thanks, Robert DuVernay. So we can have some comment. Uh, I had pretty much the same thing happen. I How had squ squirrely problems going on, and... Uh, I bought a new motherboard, and that didn't fix it. And I bought a new power supply, and that didn't make any difference. So I returned the power supply. But uh, at the time, you didn't. At think. the time, yeah, it didn't fix it. But uh, I had, a, I ended up with a computer that would just turn itself off and wait 10 seconds, turn itself back on, and do that. Uh, I don't know how long it would have done it, but I watched it do it half a dozen times and said, well, that can't be anything except the power supply. So then I bought a second power supply and put it in. And, that fixed all the problems, but it's just amazing to me, you know, electronics used to be reliable. There must be some one component, some resistors or capacitors or something like that, that they found another way to make cheaper, and um, they fail. I don't think it's semiconductors. I guess, you know, they do that with computers. The processor, you know, getting smaller and smaller transistors. Do you remember there was a time when we were using motherboards and the electrolytes out of the capacitors leaked? Yeah. And, and, and George, was fixing those. He was replacing those. And by the way, George, if you're out there, Joe says hi. <laughs> well, I had that diagnosed. I don't remember who it was told me that was the problem I had. I don't know, maybe five, five or seven years ago. So I went out and bought the capacitors and replaced them. Didn't do a thing. So I guess that's when I bought all these um, gigabyte um, U5 boards. I, I built two with that. But I think before that, I was you know, several generations behind because I don't stay on the state of the art. I like run of the mill a lot better than state of the art. It's just more reliable. But uh, I can certainly relate to your power supply problems. I've, I just did that about a year ago, and it's fr frustrating. It really is disconcerting, and I, I wish Andrew was here because I'm beginning to wonder. Andrew has had problems with his machine. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it didn't. He, he brought it up here. We couldn't get it to work. It, it booted one time. Took it home, booted right up. The next day, it wouldn't boot. So Joe and I thought it might have been a power supply, it might have been, and we didn't have a tester to try it. Might have been the motherboard. I'm thinking it may be the power supply, and I'd like to check it out. So when I see Andrew again, I'm going to ask him to bring the machine up. And since it doesn't boot, he obviously can live it out the doorstop. I want to check it out. If it needs a new power supply, I'm going to change it out. I'm pretty good at closing the door after the horse is out of the barn. So when I had all this problem and had the power supply order is going to be here, I went ahead and ordered a power supply tester because uh, Bob Schwartz told me that he had one, but he couldn't find it. Yep. Um, I had one I couldn't find for about yeah. a year. I found it the other day, and we used it. This well, is the second time since we've been here for three years that we needed it. Well, if you need one again, let me know because now I've got one that's never been used. Well, I guess that's not true. I put it on the new power supplies, and yep, power supply tester works. It says <laughs> it's a good one. So now I've got one, and I'm hoping that that will prevent me from ever having another power supply problem. Usually that sort of thing will do that. If you're prepared for it, well, it won't happen again. Power supplies are just too cheap. Joe? Oh, we need to get you mic'd up while we're getting that wired up. Let's get a mic over there for John Lum, if you don't mind, please. For John Lum. I want to talk to him about his machine in a couple of minutes. I'm waiting on Joe to get mic'd back up. I want to hear Joe's comments first, so hang on. This puts us in an interesting state, and we'll get to the browser in just a minute. Go ahead, Joe. The thing about power supply testers is they tell you if the voltage is there. What we need is a power supply that tells you if, the, if there's current, enough current available. Which means we need a voltometer. Yeah. Uh, except, yeah, yeah. But we need, we need, that's what we need. And I think... John Lum's power supply tested good, <coughs> but I think that maybe when the load gets on there, 
it, it'll drop down. We didn't test it under load. But I think that's something to consider. I agree. I agree. Now, your machine is probably four or five years old. Your power supply is what, like a 550 watt? 500. 500 watt. Um, that's a fairly easy thing to try. Uh, but as, as we go forward, looking at the machine that you've got and what we've done with it, what I'm concerned about is uh, we need to take a broader approach before we go after that. Uh, your thoughts, John? The uh, so a fix would be go up to what like six hundred watts or personally I, mean, I think power you, supplies are not expen that no, expensive so. they're not but what, for what you've got in there well maybe six fifty seven hundred watt you should go to if you're going to get a new power supply because when you use uh, things like uh, what is it you use what program you use. What do you use? Be, uh, in what? what for, for your video or your audio or pictures? Oh. Uh, Photo, Photoshop? Photoshop. Photoshop will use everything you can give yeah, it. Yeah, Photoshop yes. is the and only so the thing more, that's really processor the, yeah, intensive. The more you use, the more <laughs> power it consumes, and you're sa safer off with higher uh, wattage rating, so you can supply the extra current. All right. I'll... Uh, Start looking for sales on more powerful more power po supply. <laughs> more powerful. What kind of power supply are you going to get now? Say again. What kind of power supply are you going to get now? <laughs> a modular. Modular, right. Yes. That's the key word. Yeah, you can get a partially modular or fully modular. I would suggest the fully modular. Fully modular because all the partially modulars I've seen have the old uh, four-pin Molex connectors on them, too. Yes. And nobody uses those anymore. Nothing I use has, yes. has them anymore. My suggestion would probably be about a 650 watt, but I would look at the size and capacity, and then I would look at the prices and compare. You might be able to get a bigger power supply for less money. But right. the other thing you need to watch is the physical size. For example, the OCZ we had in here was a fairly large power supply. I put in some new NVIDIA power supplies that are higher wattage, but they're physically smaller in size, plus they have a longer warranty. And these were cheaper than what I paid for those back then. And they weighed less. I was really surprised. In fact, mm -hmm. I, can, I can pull up and show you the ones that I got so you can start looking if you want for a comparison. I don't know that that class of a power supply goes as small as a 650. I'm not sure if they started at a 750, but give me a second. I'll take a look. Let's flip over to the screen for number three for just a second. Give me a backup. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go over here to this Ryzen machine. I'm going to bring up a browser. This is a Ryzen 700 we're on. I got some stuff I'll tell you about it some more later. This is Lou's machine. And I'm going to go to Amazon, if it'll let me. Amazon's easy. Newegg is probably one of my favorite places to search for parts. But this will find what I'm looking for. It's a uh, EVGA. I believe it was a G3. Uh, there's a G3650. They make a G3550. Okay, a G3650, $107. 106.08. Now, there's a good example. A G3650 is 106.08. There's a G3750 for, what, nine cents less? More powerful? So, yes, it's overkill, but, you know, you're looking for bang for the buck. And the reason I'm looking at a G3, it's a 10-year, that says a 7-year. Okay. On the 650, we go from a 7-year to the 750, we go to a 10-year warranty. So, for $0.09 cents less, <laughs> you get three more years on the warranty. And what I would do is check the physical size of that power supply and make sure that it will accommodate inside your case. Now, did you build that machine or... Yeah, and but I, I, you know, it's easy enough to get out a ruler and measure the space available. Okay. But I'll have to, uh, you know, it's, there, there are things in that computer that had not been moved since I closed up the first time. I so, hear you. Uh, <laughs> if, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
Right. But then when it um, does break, you're like, now, if, if I go out and buy a new power supply, uh, my thought is buy one that I'm going to use when I build my new computer. And I'm glad you're making that. Now. now, is there a compatibility with connectors? They'll be the same. And, and that's a, a very important point that I'm glad you're making. Because even though we may take this step and it may not still solve your problem, it's an investment that you can then migrate to the new machine if you have to go. So it's not a waste of money or a waste of time. Do you agree, Joe? Agreed. Yeah. And by getting something that is beyond what you need is not going to hurt <coughs> what you're going to do. So going for a 750, mm -hmm. you know, a 650 is fine for the older machine, but for one of these, I'll do a 750. Now, if you go for a higher-end motherboard and think you're going to put in a higher-end video card, then you're going to want an 850-watt power supply. But a 750, right? is what we've been recommending for, for umpteen years. And for the old machine as well as for the new machine. Yes, yes, Robert. Uh, the last power supply that I did buy um, just amazed me. I don't know what brand it was or what model. It, it was probably a 7, 750 or something like that. But, um, and it was semi-modular. It had, you know, the 24-pin connector or something was hardwired, but uh, two or three other things were not. But the 8-pin connector for, I guess, uh, graphics card, yes. I don't think it's the motherboard, um, is supposed to be orange wires, four orange wires and four black wires. The orange wires have power and the black wires have ground, and the orange wires are all in a row, and the black wires are all in a row. Well, the one that came with that power supply had three orange wires and five black wires. And so I figured, well, Maybe they just put the wrong color wire in there, and so I checked it, and uh, no, that was not the case. That the sucker was grounded. So the uh, cable that they sent me would have blown something if I had used it. And that's a very important point. Whenever you change the power supply, always change the cables. The pinout to the devices are the same, but the pinout into the power supply can and will be different. For example, well, I checked that. I checked the, the voltages at the power supply connector, and they were just what you'd expect them to be. It was just the cable that was wrong, and I had to build a cable, I think. Uh, I think I had to solder some wires together to get it to fit. But at any rate, I put a, a good cable on there, and everything's fine. But who would have thought so they that they would have not even tested that cable? So they sent made. you the wrong cable? Well, but nobody wants a cable with three power lines and five ground wires on a graphics card. Joe, a graphics card? Yeah. You ever heard of an eight-pin graphics card that only has three yeah. power pins and five grounds? Well, then that might also have been a, a, an eight-pin for the motherboard, too. Well, whatever it was for, I don't remember which one it was for. Uh, I know that's not what they wanted. You know, what I received was not useful. And if I had plugged it in, I don't know what would have suffered. Maybe the power supply would have just folded and, you know, just never turned on because of having a shorted output. Uh, or I could have burned a hole in uh, one of the boards, either the motherboard or the graphics card, eat up some copper. With some of the original modular power supplies, you could interconnect and you could get something plugged into the wrong place. The reason I mention the EVGA is they are marked and they will tell you that it's an EVGA brand. It'll tell you if it's G2 or G3 or whatever, but it also shows you which end goes to what device. Like if it's PCI mm -hmm. Express, if it's peripherals, if it's VGA, it'll have a gray plug on it. If it's for the motherboard, it'll be motherboard one, two, three, and four. All that stuff is clearly stenciled. Yeah. It's silk screened on the, on the plug. So Well, this wasn't that kind of thing. This was just an, an error. Uh, and some video cards will either have two eight pin plugs or they'll have an eight pin and a six pin. Yes. Or they could have two six pins, or it could be just one six pin. Yeah, yeah. Been through yes, all sir. that. One o'clock right now. Okay, folks, it's one o'clock. Welcome to Builder Buy. We got started a little bit early, but we had lots of things to talk about. This issue with power supplies is a big deal. And to reiterate, in the past, when a power supply didn't work, it just didn't work. It didn't come on. Andrew, glad you're here. We'll get a mic on Andrew for just a second. I wanted to ask you, Andrew, your machine that we had trouble with it working, have you had it working yet, the desktop machine? Yes, it stopped about a week ago, and I haven't tried it since then. Though. Okay, when you say it stopped, what do you mean it stopped? It'll just lose signal. Uh, won't no signal go to the mouse, keyboard, or monitor. 
I think what your problem is, you know, we were trying to talk about it last time. I said it was either motherboard or power supply. If, if it's not working right now, bring it up. I want to take a look at it because I think you may have a power supply problem. We didn't have a, a power supply tester and we didn't have a voltmeter either one. But I'd sure like to, uh, I'd like to check it out, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. I'll be glad to. I'll need to hang on to it for at least a week. So bring it up like next Wednesday and then I can bring it to you the following Wednesday. Not a problem. Okay. I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's, it's funny, these spooks we have with power supplies. Like I said, this was an OCZ power supply I had on my FX machine. I built that FX machine four months before I could get my hands on Horizon, and it's been working pretty good. And then it, in the middle of the night a couple of times, it rebooted that little woman's voice. You've lost Internet. Internet connection restored. And by the way, that's not Killer Networks, as I reiterate. That was another application doing that. In fact, it was one of my desktop gadgets doing that. I've turned that off so I don't have to just mute the computer. But anyway, that machine, when I rebuilt it, I didn't put a new power supply in because I had an OCZ. It worked. So I had to replace my power supply. And then Lou's Ryzen machine, I had to replace her power supply because when we went through Lou's machine, her motherboard had gone out, but her power supply was also going out. And we weren't getting enough power to the motherboard. That's why we were getting those beep errors that are supposed to be dealing with the 64K of memory, the lower 64K. Change out the power supply, problem solved. Now, I had some other problems because of that power supply that I had to go back and, anyway, after about 10 hours, Lou's machine is running fantastic. The only thing she doesn't have is the ability to hot swap, but that still needs a BIOS update. And as of two days ago, we still don't have a BIOS update for the uh, gigabyte board, but there was another BIOS update for compatibility on the MSI board. Now, the MSI board is a board I want to try because it's got all the bells and whistles. I'm not recommending it, but I love it. And if somebody wants to go for the whole nine yards, I mean, that's what I call putting on the dog. That board works. Okay, so power supplies, motherboards, things can happen. I can show you also, have you all ever used the RAM tester in Windows 10? Did you, have you used it, David? It's pretty interesting. I tried it on Lou's machine and it told me that there was an issue with the memory. And that was before I replaced the power supply. And I, I found it most helpful. Let me go over to her machine and I'll show you what I'm talking about. See if I can bring it up. I'm going to minimize this. I'm just going to do start. And I believe it's called Windows Diagnostics is what you look for. Oops, didn't spell that right. Windows. Yeah, there it is. Windows Memory Diagnostic. Now, when I bring this up, it'll restart and check for problems. We'll go to a command prompt. Now, I'm going to do this for just a second so the screen may go blank. Check for problems next time. I'm going to do it right now. Let it bring it up. Now, when it restarts, it'll come back up with this program from a command prompt, and it'll, it'll take a look at the RAM. It runs two passes. takes probably 15 minutes. We're not going to go through it. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. But as you saw, I went to uh, Windows Diagnostic, and it calls it this program. And at the end of it, it's supposed to show you a result of what's going on with your RAM. I was not sitting at the computer when it rebooted, so I have no idea what was going on. But I found it most curious. As soon as the machine comes back up, there we are. Aorus. It's the Aorus motherboard, Gigabyte Aorus. Okay, Windows is checking for memory problems. This might take several minutes. Running test. Pass, one of two, zero percent complete. Then it shows an overall status. Now we'll see a progress bar in between there. And now status, this is no problems have been detected yet. Originally on Lou's machine when I ran this, immediately it said there was a problem before it even gotten to maybe 5%. And so that right there left me scratching my head trying to decide what was going on. Although the test may appear inactive at times, it is still running. Please wait until testing is complete. Windows will restart the computer automatically. Test results will be displayed again after you log on. I'm not going to let this finish. It's just the important part is status. Something else. You know these blue screens we've had in the past? Have you all ever noticed, or has anybody had a blue screen from Windows? It comes up there with one of those uh, error code barcodes you can catch with your camera. Now, if I'm sitting in front of a computer and I have a problem and I'm going blink, blink, what's going on, 
I don't have time to think about grabbing a smartphone and taking a picture of it. And I'm not sitting there with a smartphone to take a picture of it because I'm not planning on one of those error codes. But if you read the error codes, it also says you can go to windows.com slash. And if you go to that URL, nothing exists. Thank you, Microsoft. It's like SOL. So I don't know why they programmed that in there because it's hard coded to tell you to go to that website where nothing exists for that stop error. Now there are sites you can go to like Event ID. Event ID, I believe it's eventid.net. You go into your logs, shows what the error codes are, you look up those, and you go through all this blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying if you start having problems and you didn't, and it's like a ghost you're trying to chase down, you might want to check the power supply. Now with John Lum, we're going to try power supply. With Andrew, I think we're to power supply. With John, if the power supply doesn't solve your problem, you're going to get one big enough that you can then transfer it to a new machine. When you decide to go to a new machine, now you're in that spot. Do I build a brand new old one or do I build a brand new new one? And because of where I'm at with my experience, I'm more inclined to say build a brand new new one. And I'm more inclined to say build a Ryzen machine. Did you all read about the uh, little problem that Intel's having where you can, uh, well, the machines are at risk? Oh, I would. You want, you want to talk about it? Let's get, a, let's get a mic back there. Thank you. Get it on David. I'll get a camera up there. All I need you to do is just stand still wherever you're going to be. That's hard for that, him. I know. He's like popcorn. That's perfect. I like popcorn, by the way. Yes, sir. So, um, at the first of last week, it was revealed that um, there exists on most um, Intel? Intel processors built since 2007. It goes that far back. A... Um, processor within a, the processor that uh, does stuff that is transparent to the uh, operating system and that uh, and, and, sub and, and subsequently uh, no uh, virus protection or uh, malware um, programs could possibly uh, see it or affect it. And the machine and could even be turned off. And the machine can be turned off. Uh, initial reports were that um, this was part of uh, of Intel's uh, AMT, uh, and I'd have to look at my notes to tell you exactly what this is. But you can find pretty good um, discussion of this on this week and last week's uh, Security Now podcast by. Uh, Gibson researches Steve Gibson on the uh, twit.tv um, podcast network. Uh, he has about the most clear understanding of this of anybody I've seen. Um, Ars Technica has a discussion of it that uh, will leave you uh, scratching your head, as everything uh, other report I've, I've seen does. But basically, this processor under within the processor uh, that is not seen by the operating system can allow um, and was designed for um, enterprise administrators to be able to remotely do things to uh, batches of computers uh, without interfering with the operating system. And this is not just corporate desktops, but it can affect. It's not. It can, it, and it affects every. Um, Almost every Intel processor uh, built since 2007 with the, uh, I think it's the, well, anyway, uh, with, with a certain technology, which is most of them. And uh, however, it appears that uh, the processors that Apple gets for its computers are not affected. But um, as it turns out, uh, this is not uh, something that will allow just anybody on the internet in 
in Russia to come and uh, interfere with uh, or look at your look into and control your computer but it will allow anybody that's on your local network to do that uh, <clears throat> so if you have <clears throat> Exxon and anybody that's on Exxon's uh, system network can can do something with your with your computer and it relates to Intel's motherboard management technology that's right yeah um, and IMT, I, I think, right. is, what is, is, is the overall thing. Um, Intel at first denied that this was going on. There have been people that have been, been saying, there have been uh, security experts that were, had discovered something along this and, and queried uh, Intel about it, and they said, oh, no, 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 no. But uh, it's been proven that, the, that it is. Um, Frustrating. Uh, it really is not something that you should worry about. Uh, but in order to actually to in order to turn on the ability for uh, somebody from um, Trump's favorite country, Russia, uh, to uh, that's a Democrat's favorite country, <laughs> to uh, look into your computer and control your computer, you would have to go into you would have to download a program that Intel has really available. Um, and install it on your computer and then turn something on within that program. But still, anybody that's on your network can, can, can do that. It's an FYI to, to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. is. And more about it next week. So, sounds good. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay, so we've talked about motherboards. We've talked about uh, where John is at, power supplies. Now, going forward, John, with, where you're, with what you're doing, where do you think you're going to uh, go? Do we still have a mic? Where do you think you're going to go with this? Well, you want know, some time to do some more research? Yeah, but I'll have to speed it up a little bit. I got to get <laughs> in, get in my case and measure the uh, size of that power supply. Right. Get online, start start looking for one that will fit a modular power supply. The issue you're going to have is going to be on the depth. And that's what you're going to be looking at. Since you built the machine, one of these power supplies should fit very easily. As far as the, uh, the length and the width, it'll fit the compartment, but the depth is my concern. And, but I know one of these, in fact, uh, will fit your case. But I would still measure it just to double check it. Yeah, I'm, I would imagine that new, more efficient power supplies are probably physically smaller as a rule. Yes, I was, I was really old surprised. Ones. And I was surprised. Uh, start looking at cases and making sure that the size is compatible on the uh, micro ATX cases, yes. although I'm probably uh, it's safe there. So you're, you're looking at the micro ATX and you're probably looking at then the uh, B350 chipset. Yeah. And so you'd probably want to get a processor accordingly. Since you're going to use a B350 chipset, I don't think personally you want to use a Ryzen 7. I think it'd be overkill. You'd probably be good with like a Ryzen 5. Yeah. And that's what I'd want to gear toward. And since the Ryzen 5 has come out, we're seeing BIOS updates to accommodate it. Just like when the next round of processors come out, we'll see a BIOS update to accommodate those as well. So right. I'm sure we'll be doing some email back and forth, uh, taking a look at some specs, trying to hone that down and get it right where you need it to be. I got all that, got that spec sheet, my revised spec sheet. Of course, it's sitting in that non-functional computer in the trunk of my car. I understand <laughs> but that. But I just... Gave me an idea on how to uh, get access to that. So, by feeding, by running that uh, hard drive into my laptop. Oh, all you got to have is power and SATA. Which uh, I can get some of that data out of there that I in, in store it in my laptop. So. <laughs> I was in that boat too. I can I can relate. That's why I like these removable racks. But going for what you're doing you need some kind of docking station that'll give you USB 3 access to that drive. Yeah, but uh, I'll go down to Micro Center and check it out. It Find what you need. So you're gonna keep us posted then on what you're gonna build later. Right. Okay, so moving on. Um, I want us, before we get too much further on, we're gonna come back to some of the technology and the talking points, and I wanna talk to uh, Dwayne about where he's at 
with his laptop issue. But Joe's got a new browser he's going to show us, and I'd like to get to that before we get wound up into this other stuff. You feel like talking about it, Joe? Sure. Okay. Let's put on number five. Okay. Um, I was just looking for some other things on the Internet the other day, and I came across a new browser called Clix, C-L-I-Q-Z. Anybody heard of that? Well, it's supposed to be a good browser, so I put it on my machine here, and um, I've been trying to set it up. It's not set up like I like it yet, but it's, it's going there. But it's got some good points on it. Uh, if you look at the uh, options, it's got one thing here that, uh, in the privacy, <clears throat> that I have not seen on any other machine, and that's has got the forget mode. And what that means is, make it easier to read. And it helps. If you accidentally get it, go to an adult site, and uh, you don't want that history in your, in your hist you know, that site in your history, you just hit the forget button and it's gone. It doesn't show up in history anymore. Like so, that. Or, you know, if you're, if you're at working someplace and you're doing some shopping online, you hit the forget button. So if the boss comes along, he hit, hit it and you're right back into company business again. So anyway, that, that's a good part. And how'd you find it? Just looking for a browser? No, I was not looking for a browser at all. I was looking for <coughs> a problem I had with, um, with um, Firefox. And uh, this it came across this, so I looked at it. It sounded good, and so I downloaded it and put it on uh, my laptop and my desktop so I could play with it and see what it, else it does. It's supposed to, what I like about this, uh, I really like about this thing is it, it goes into um, security. It, it looks at all of the um, sites you go to, and it'll tell you whether or not it's a good site. Remember we had that other program called Web of Trust? This does the same thing from what I gather. And, and if you mark it bad one time, it just won't go there anymore. Yes. Uh, I would point out that the Web of Trust has been found untrustworthy. Oh, I know that. That's yes. what I'm saying. It's no longer being used by us. It, by it, it appears that this forget does the same thing that the incognito uh, mode does in Chrome and uh, Firefox. Yep. So. And they're also really uh, tightly in bed with um, Ghostery. I'm sure most of you have heard of Ghostery. Well, that's that uh, that detects people who are trying to collect personal data from you on your machine and it blocks them. So if somebody's trying to just go fishing for your addresses so they can send you ads, and that comes in, Ghostry will, will, will block that one. Robert, do you have a comment? Yeah, while we're on security, uh, somewhere, maybe Kim Commando, I got some notice about uh, Google Docs as having been found to be compromised. And so if somebody handed you a Google Docs, it'd probably be a pretty good idea not to open it. And two or three days later, I got an email from a high school classmate of mine who died about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And he says, man, you ought to check this out. And there was a Google Docs.pdf attached. So I had discarded, discounted, I guess, notification because I'd never heard of Google Docs. So uh, I don't do it, you know, I don't trade it with anybody. So uh, I would have been suspicious of it anyway. Uh, but there it was, just two or three days after I heard about it, and so I sent it out to all the people that I emailed to and say, watch out for Google Docs. I wasn't expecting one, but I got one, and another high school classmate of mine came back and says, well, I got two of them from Tom, you know, this week. One of them was blank, and the other one, you know, somehow he just closed them. I said, well, don't open anymore. So I guess Google Docs is out there. Google Docs.pdf is what I saw. That's frustrating. Uh, and uh, since I knew that uh, it came from a bad address, <clears throat> I knew it was a scam, you know, before I opened it. But uh, if you trust the source, you could get in trouble. 
unless Thanks. you're already in the habit of trading Google Docs back and forth, and if you are, well, it's probably routine. That's why we back up, and that's why we uh, image our systems. Exactly. Have y'all noticed Macrium Reflect is upgrading? Oh, I'm sorry. Dwayne, yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. In Google Chrome, I'm having a problem, which I don't know how to attack. Uh, in reading the newspapers, Chronicle, New York Times, etc., when it comes up and it will show pictures, say it'll say photos, and it'll be showing one of three, one of three, and so you supposed to press on the button and it will scroll you through the gallery. It doesn't scroll me through the gallery. It just all I ever see is the first picture in the gallery. And also, often, several times on uh, a video, the video will come up and it's whirring like it's trying to load. And sometimes when I click on it, it will go ahead and play. Other times it spins and it's, you know, it's not because I don't have enough bandwidth, but uh, I haven't, I've been able to go to Firefox and not have the problem. So I don't know what settings or what is the problem in Chrome. And I gather from the silence that nobody does either. <laughs> well, uh, I haven't tried it. I, I mean, I haven't had that problem, but I don't use Google. I don't use Chrome that much. But right now I'm trying to compare the, I've got four browsers on my machine right now. I've got Chrome, Google, uh, Clicks, and of course the built-in built -in disconnected edge. You Sorry. heard about that, right? Microsoft is disconnecting Edge from automatic updates. Interesting. Because they, they want, to be, you want you to be able to go to it anytime you want to and get the latest browser. So that, that takes it out of the uh, you know, Microsoft update cage. That update cage is annoying as it is. It is. Can we get a mic over there for uh, JB? That's why I call it the disconnected edge. Yeah. So it's now on a, almost on a standalone basis. Dwayne, sorry I couldn't answer your question a while ago because I was working on something. I was can't do two things at once. Sorry. Uh, this clicks is this based on uh, Mozilla or not? Well, it's interesting you ask that because Mozilla is uh, there's an article out Mozilla is investing money in it because it looks a little bit like Mozilla, but like. Joe said it also looks a little bit like Chrome. But you know, one of the different, I've got, I've got Chrome up right now, okay? And I, if I go from there, get rid of that and bring up clicks, that's got a lot of stuff that I like, but one thing it doesn't have that I have so far have not been able to find is this menu bar up here, which I have in Mozilla, which I use. So that's not just, you know, the, it's a really way to get quick history, you know, and a lot of things. And I can't find where in either clicks or um, uh, Chrome or Microsoft browser, you know, the same functions. Now, it might have it available, but, you know, like in a sidebar thing. But I want it up on top where I can, where I can look at it, where I can see it and go to it. I just looking, just searched on clicks, and it's in August of 2016, Mozilla invests in Germany's clicks. And then in 2017, clicks buys Ghostry. So well, clicks now owns Ghostry. Well, they're working on LastPass because they're pushing LastPass too. Interesting. And somehow it says you can use add clicks as an extension in Firefox to use whatever their special search feature is. Well, so I'm clicks is available as an extension for Firefox. JB had a question. Yes, JB. Well, for the past week, I've had a problem with Firefox. LastPass 
does not show up its icon in oh, Firefox. Oh, hold your mic up. Uh, for the past week, I've had a problem with Firefox. My last pass extension will not show up its icon in Firefox since it updated to the latest, very latest version of Firefox. Last pass extensions? Yeah, yeah. To, to bring up the fire, the uh, last pass functions. Uh, I've got it here on my, this machine. I've got three accounts set up: two user accounts and one master account, administrator account. It does show up in the administrator account, but I can't get it on either of the user accounts. I had a similar problem to that uh, uh, using Feedly, the RSS, when I installed it in Firefox. And if you, it, it basically it's hiding those icons, and so I had to go into whatever place it's hide these icons, and then drag it up to the toolbar. But I think I suspect if you search online, it will tell you how to do that. Well, I've been finding things that are several years old, but nothing that's current. What you should do, uh, and this will probably solve your problem, is uh, remove the program and uh, re download it again and reinstall it. I did. No? Okay. I removed Firefox and I removed uh, LastPass and reinstalled both of them. And how did you remove it? Did you go into programs and features and remove yes. it there? Well, then try something like CCleaner to remove it. See, that tries, works for you, JB. OK. Any more on uh, Click C? It's a German product. It's built as a uh, private search browser. So I haven't seen a new browser in quite a while. And it's interesting Mozilla's investing in it. New technology. Any more questions about the browser? None? OK. Click Z browser. OK, I mentioned a while ago about Macrium Reflect. Macrium Reflect is upgrading to version 7. I got an email on that. I'm going to go to that computer here, which is can, computer number 4. Computer number 4. Thank you. Okay, Macrium Reflect, if I go to this, I'll hold down the control key, click enter. It's now still version 6, but it says here, coming soon, Macrium Reflect 7 edition. And I got an email to the same effect that says Macrium Reflect 7 now available. So the paid version has it. And there's a discount coupon code to purchase Macrium Reflect Home Edition single license and four packs. And yes, I do have four paid copies of it. Going forward, it's a possibility. But version 7 is out. And to reiterate, that's something you always want to be sure we do, either clone, image, or backup. Oh, yes, Robert. Um, with Macrium changing, just something just occurred to me that might, somebody else might run into, but um, I'm still doing an uh, image of the C drive every Wednesday from 12.30 to however long it takes. Uh, so if I update, that may very well mean that uh, my old images won't restore. So that tells me when I do do the update, I need to get a new directory name for where to put the updates on subsequent Wednesdays, uh, Wednesdays uh, and keep the old version around because if I do try to, to restore to one of those, uh, you know, it might not work with the new software. So if you run into that when you change, instead of throwing your old backups away, you save them for a while. Um, or maybe I'll put a, a note in there somewhere because I've, 
my disk is essentially full. It's two terabytes. And so I have told Macrium to uh, delete the oldest backup uh, anytime it gets down to less than 600 gigabytes uh, because it takes about 200 gigabytes to, uh, to do the backup. And so now it turns out it's deleting one every time and it's always sitting there right at uh, around 500 gigabytes spare, which is, you know, 25%. I read that the uh, the old backups are going to be good. What you will have to do is make a new boot recovery disk. disk. Yeah. I re yeah, a new boot disk, but, and, but the old backups will, should still work. Well, that's one thing I think that program is good about. If it recognizes that you have not yet run a recovery disk when you run it, it'll okay. remind you. And it if does. you do do it, I get it sets the flag and it quits telling you that. So that's one thing good about that program. Uh, if you run it, it'll tell you if you need to make a new disk. As long as you don't set that flag to say, don't remind me anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> make the disk first, then, yes. then you can set the flag. Now, with Lou's machine, she's got four disks in her machine. I'm going to go to this Ryzen computer, which is number three. Let's go to that computer, number three. Thank you. And I'm going to bring up Explore, Start E. And you can take a look here and see how many drives she has in this box. I'll click on this PC. There's the C drive couple of burners, actually a, a burner DVD-ROM and a DVD-RW. But we've got the clone and image drive, we got a data drive, and a Windows 7 64 Pro, which was the old computer. So to run this machine, there are two drives. <coughs> There's one drive we've been pulling data off of, and in effect, it is a backup itself because it's not going to be booted anymore. And when we're through pulling data off of it, we'll unplug it for a period of time, maybe three to six months so that then we can start using it for the same thing to rotate clones. Now, I have labeled the drives, and the nice thing about it is this one terabyte C drive, an NVMe. When I bring this up in the software, and I'll do it in just a second, when I bring this up in the Macrium Reflex software, it'll show that that is an SSD number one, and number two, it shows that it's an NVMe drive. And the data drive is the two drives that are gonna work together, so you have a C and a G. So we use the NVMe, the C drive, to install the applications. We use the other drive when we download stuff, when we keep stuff, when we store stuff, email, everything is pointed to that drive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone that first drive, then I'm going to image the second drive. So I'm going to clone the first drive over to this clone and image drive. And every time I clone, I have to reset the label because it'll give it the same label. So once I clone, while I'm in that process, I also resize because that NVMe drive is one terabyte. But the clone and image drive is two terabytes. So I'm going to clone the C drive, resize the partition, and then when I'm done, go back, call the program up again, and then say, let's image that second drive, which is the G drive, which is the data drive. And the data drive has the data that's copied off of the Windows 7 64 Pro. Got it? Nope. Which means I'm going to be coming over once in a month to clone your machine because you hadn't done it since 2014. So I'm, I'm going to leave this up where I can find it and I've got a shortcut on the bar here for Macrium Reflect. I'm going to call it up and I'll show you what I do on Lou's machine. Now, I'm not setting the flag not to ask me again for rescue media. Yes, it's important to do this, but it's one of those things that says, do like I say, not like I do. Be sure and create that rescue media. I'm not going to do that right now. What I'm going to do is look at these disks. That first disk is an MBR, and I don't think I have Magnify set on Lou's machine yet. Maybe I do. Yeah, I do. There's the magnifier. So that's an MBR disk. That was our old C drive, and there's the label. So one, one drive, two drive. All these others now are GPT. So I'm going to scroll on down. I'm going down to the fourth drive. There's the data drive. And there's the Samsung. It says Samsung SSD 960 Evo. And I put on the label that that is the one terabyte NVMe. Okay, that's the drive I'm going to copy. So I'm going to zoom back out for just a minute so I can see everything. So if you'll notice where it says clone an image, wherever I click, wherever it's at, that's what it wants to do. I want the last drive 
then I'm going to clone. Once I've cloned it and resized that final partition, because it's a one terabyte, I'm then going to go to the data drive and just that partition, and I'm going to image that partition onto the, of the drive. So I click on this. Now it says clone. Okay, I'm going to clone the disk. And this is what Joe is talking about. We're going to select the disk. And that's the NVMe drive. I'm going to look at my drives. I don't want the MBR. I don't want the data drive. I want the one that says clone an image. So I'm going to select this disk to clone to. Okay. I'm going to clone to that. I'm going to delete all those existing partitions. Delete existing partition. Delete existing partition. Delete existing partition. Delete existing partition. Now, I'm going to say copy select partitions, which is all of those, because I'm cloning the drive. I've clicked on it. Now I'm going to go to the next step like Joe talks about. Click and drag. Oh, it's not doing the click and drag. Sorry, there you Yeah, but that's what we had to do in the past. We had to, we had to do a click and drag. But it's already got them set. There should be a uh, clone partition properties. I don't remember if it was here. Yeah, here we go. Here's where I can resize the partition. Cancel that. I want this partition right here. Now click and drag. I've got it all the way over. Cancel it again. This partition. Highlight, highlight. See a little bar underneath it? A little bit bigger. I've highlighted clone partition properties. Click and drag. I don't have to have separate software like a partition manager or to use Windows to do this. I'm doing this within Macrium Reflect. Now, if somebody asks me how to do this later, I have to have it in front of me looking at it to see it. So I've got it resized. I'm going to say OK. I've extended that partition. If I go ahead and click Next, then I'm copying all this stuff over again, which is fine. We'll go to Next. And it's going to say Finish, and it's going to give me a chance to do a label. Now then, I'm going to say this is Clone. C, C drive, and I'm going to give it a date, which is 5, 10, 27, 10. Clone C drive. I'm going to say OK. Now, the following drives will be overwritten. That's the clone and image drive. That was 050917. I'm going to say continue. Now, we are now cloning that drive, and we've also told it to resize the partition on the two terabyte to make use of all the space. And this doesn't take too long. It's a one terabyte drive. There's not a lot of data on there. The more data we get, the slower it goes. But it's also an NVMe drive. And it moves fairly quickly. It says overall progress 1%, current progress 100%. And it says checking file system cloned completely. Operation one of two of three, we're on per operation number four. And we are now copying the partition. See Gil, if, if you've got a few minutes, I've got another topic. Well, I'd love to do another topic, but if we get off topic, I think it'll be confusing. So I want to stay on topic because when I get through with this, I'll close the program and call it back up, and then we're going to image. This is something we always do on the first Wednesday, but we've kind of been lax because of the Ryzen technology, and I think it's important to, to show this process. It doesn't take that long. And I just want to explain it because as we, as we verbally go through this, it's kind of like capturing. If you've never done it before, it's a new animal. But once you've done capturing, man, you're like, ah, I'm going to capture this and I'm going to capture that. Same thing with cloning a drive. We can walk through the process, and when it works, it's great. But like with John Lum, when it doesn't work, this really sucks. And so with John's, we had to figure out what the problem was. And if we can solve John's problem of being able to clone with a power supply, that puts him off a little bit further. But if a power supply doesn't solve his problem, then we've got to replace the motherboard. And if we replace the motherboard, then we're talking RAM, motherboard, and processor. And with Andrew, same thing. I'm hoping the power supply is going to solve Andrew's problem. That'll be easy to test. 
I can unplug his power supply with all his cables, plug in a different power supply, and if it works, then all I got to do is get one that fits inside the case. I got to measure the space because that is a tight little case he has. Now, this is at 20, 30%, 32%. And this is operation number four. We're getting all that little stuff. Now, this C drive is an NVMe drive. I'm cloning it, and I should be able to boot from it, but I'm not going to test that capability. Because if I was smart, I would have created the rescue media, which I haven't done. I'm just backing up everything. I'm cloning. And clone is fast and easy, but so is imaging. And the point of this is I've got my data. I can restore this. And it's real easy to do. It doesn't take long. You can automate the process. I like doing it manually. Because when I get through with this, I'm going to go back and put a label on that drive before I go and start doing the images. I'm a little bit anal about that because I want to be very careful about what I'm doing. Yes, Robert. Another thing I do for clones, uh, I keep an icon in the lower right-hand corner uh, of all of my disks, and it shows the date on which I last did something to it. Uh, typically, it would be I cloned this one, uh, you know, the date of the cloning. But uh, any notes, like um, I was just put in some new program, or any other feature that I want to be able to identify uh, is in the title of that empty folder that is the icon in the lower right hand corner. And that's, that's smart advice. Very smart advice. There's because, all sorts of notes you can put there. Because when you're doing this, it's easy to do it now. Trying to go back later and remember what you were doing later, that's impossible. Yes, David. So I've got a tip that might save many of you. Um, problem. Yes, sir. Uh, if any of you are going to update to Windows Creators update. Hold off as long as you can, folks. Uh, I don't agree. Uh, you know, it, it, you have a good luck with if it? If your machine is, if you've been keeping your machine up to date, uh, then your machine's probably ready for it. And there's a uh, Windows Update Assistant which I find is probably the uh, easiest way to do the update. Um, just go to Google and, and uh, look for Windows Update Assistant. It'll take you to a Microsoft page. Uh, and, and it's really uh, quite straightforward. For, for, the, for the Update Assistant? Yeah. I got a link up on Builder Buy from, uh, I think, two weeks ago for it. And I've done it several times within the last week, but Yesterday, I decided, well, I was going to minimize that window while, and, and kind of root around in the system and look for some other things while, and I could not figure out how to get it back up there. Hmm. <laughs> but the, the thing is that it's in your notification area, um, a little uh, Windows icon, window, Hold Windows that window icon. I've just finished the clone. Okay. Go ahead. So, you know, everybody knows where the notification area is in the lower right hand uh, uh, side of the taskbar. Uh, to the left of the uh, time and such, usually. But there uh, is a little uh, arrow that, um, that right, right there, there it is. And, and if, you're, uh, if you're doing the, the Windows update and you minimize it, then uh, you can maximize it by going or resize it by going back into into there. Good to know. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. I'm going to go back over here to the main screen. I want to zoom out for just a second. It shows the drive that's up, the one terabyte. I'm going to close it. It took five minutes and 34 seconds. Five minutes and 34 seconds. I'm going to close it. I'm going to close the application. Now I'm looking at my drive, and I see my C drive and my F drive. So I'm going to change this label on the F drive, and I'm going to call this clone and image. Administrator, yes. So that's the clone and image drive. There's not a lot of data there. 
And if you notice the difference in the amount of free space and used space, it's because one terabyte, two terabyte. Okay, I'll close this. I'll bring up Macrium Reflect again because now we're going to go in. I'm not going to do the media right now. We're going to go in and we're going to image the uh, data drive. I'll magnify this for just a second. That's a shortcut key for magnify. They've got it for disk management. Okay, right here. This is the clone and image drive. That's what I've got. The data drive is what I want. So I'm going to click on this partition. And if you notice, this popped down here for clone this disk or image this disk. Click that partition. There's actions. I can image this partition only. I can look at file system properties. I can analyze the file system. All I want to do is image this partition. So that's what I'm going to do. And it's giving me a box popped up. Let me zoom out. And the box that's popped up says select source and image destination. So the source is the data drive. And the location it's going to go to is going to be, as soon as it pops back up, on this F drive. It says F G drive image. So what we've got to do is going to check it. I'll bring up Explorer again, this PC. See, clone an image is the F drive, and that's where we want it to go. So the folder it's going to be is on the F drive. And what we're going to grab is this data that's on the G drive. And I've got a folder for it because G drive image. And it'll put it on the F drive called G drive image. I'm going to say next. Because it doesn't exist, so I'll say create the folder. It used to exist. It'll exist now. I can set the properties, full, differential, incremental. I'm going with the default. I'm not even selecting a template for the backup plan. I'm going to click on next. Purge the oldest backup set if less than five gigs on the target volume. Minimum one gig. Click on next. Click on finish. Now this will be my backup. So again the backup. Let's go look over here at the drive. We're actually going to image the data drive, which happens to be G. So the backup, we're going to call this image, get rid of the caps lock, image, back over, data drive G. So image G data drive, and I'm going to give it a date, 5, 10, 2017. I'm going to say OK. Now it's going to proceed to do its thing. And it's going to take not too long. It'll take less time to do this than the other one did. That took uh, the first, what, five minutes and something? This might take three minutes. There's data there, but not a lot of data. There is not as much data on that drive as the drive that it originally came off of, because the original drive was bootable and had Windows on it. The original drive was a C drive. I don't need everything that was on that drive. All I've done is copy the data over. When Lou gets to the machine, she will install her applications and will point and say, the data is not on C, the data is over here on this other drive. And then we'll take that other drive, which is drive number four, the original drive from Windows 764. We will unplug it and let it sit dormant. If we need something off of it in three to six months, it's still there. But if we haven't needed it in three to six months, then we'll reformat it and cycle it to do the cloning and the imaging, whatever we need, so that the data is always intact. We won't be losing anything. When this whole process started, Lou had had some power problems. And the concern was, because the power problems Lou had had, and yes, the machine had been on a UPS, there had been some time without power. So Lou first thought the hard drive wouldn't come up, but the hard drive was bad. I said, no problem, get you a couple of drives. You're as good to go from your last clone. When did you last clone it? She said, well, I hadn't gotten around to that lately. I said, when was it last cloned? She said, when you did it. So I checked the date from the Bell Arc file, 2014. I said, well, isn't that special? 
did such a good job. Yeah, <laughs> did, did such a good job. Well, I was on the phone, so she couldn't, couldn't reach me. Spanked me. Your husband will let you on the computer at night. Well, I think he may not mind it now because we've changed the power supply, so we've solved the noise problem. Thinks it costs too much to run at night. Well, you know, there's different theories about where you run a computer or whether you turn it off, whether you, you know, there's, there's two schools of thought on that. I've, I've gone the one extreme where I keep everything on all the time. And from what my experience has been, it lasts longer. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. We are at uh, 23%. Anyway, your, your problem started that you perceived to be a hard drive, so you got two more drives. So we had these two drives brand new in a box when I got the machine, and I had problems with it. I said, looks like it's the motherboard. And as time went by, the motherboard had gone south, the power supply was causing problems because I could not originally get the system up. It wouldn't come up. And if I can't get into the motherboard BIOS, then... So anyway, we built the machine, and instead of building a brand new old machine, we built a brand new new machine. Ryzen 7, 1700. I think that's a good place to be for what you're going to be doing. Still the same amount of RAM, 16 gigs of RAM, but you've got that one terabyte NVMe drive. We're cloning, or we have cloned, and now we're imaging the data. And once we go through all this at your house, you get your applications installed, we'll do this again. Less than 15 minutes. Nothing up my sleeves. Watch the magic. And this program is free. You can get the paid version. It does more stuff. But for what you need to do, you can't beat the price of this. Macrium Reflect. And transfer rate is uh, just under a gig a minute. We're at 35%. So when that, gets, when that gets finished, then we'll uh, switch back over to it. But my point is, we'll be finished at that point. So your machine, from what we've shown, we've cloned the drive, we resized the partition on the clone drive since it was a one to a two terabyte, and that extra space then we used from the other data drive created an image on that drive. You so say this uh, yes, JB. is a free program, Mac your M7? Do I expect what? Is this Macrium 7 you're using? No, this is the free version, so this is still Macrium 6 point whatever. 6.3. Yeah, so the uh, Macrium 7 free will be out at some point. I just don't know when. I just checked their website, and it says coming soon. Coming soon, right. Well, like I said, I got the email, and I can bring that up on this computer over here, which is number... Four. We can bring that up on screen, and it says available now. I'd like to offer you 20% discount on all purchase of Macro Reflex 7 Home, made in the next seven days. Macro Reflex 7 is available now and has a number of additional features not available in six. Okay. The paid version is version seven. The free version is version six point whatever. Let's see. Macro Reflex. It just says version 6 free edition. So I don't know when they're going to make the version 7 <coughs> free available. 30 days, 90 days, I don't know. It's coming. Like I said, I have a license for the paid version that I will probably at some point upgrade as well because there have been times where I've needed that capability and uh, that's why I bought it for four machines. It was like a piece of insurance. Macrium. The newest version is 6.3.1745. Okay. Because this thing just updated a few minutes ago. Let's go over to number five, and that's on Joe's machine. Where does it show it? Up here at the top. Oh, I see it. 6.3.1745. Okay. And it updated today? That's of, as of just a few minutes ago, yeah. Interesting. <coughs> I like that. Nice capability. Go back over to this machine for just a minute. So check our progress. It says it's going to need three more minutes. So it took as long to image that drive as it did to clone the first drive. So still, for the amount of time and what you're doing, it's, it's just cheap insurance. Any questions about cloning or imaging? Can you see the data rate that it's using for that uh, image? Yes. It says, uh, thank you. 
it says it's got uh, transfer rate one gig. Let me magnify so you can see that, which is pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Yeah, I've never seen anything like that. Overall progress, 65% transfer rate, one gig a second. Huh. Reading file system, bitmap, saving partition. And that's all we're doing is that one partition. Clone image, free space, 1.78 terabyte. Delete oldest backup sets with free space is less than five gigs. Creating volume snapshot, please wait. And all these programs rely on volume shadow copy. And it drops down to 950, but we're staying at least 900. 71%. Says it's going to need another two minutes. What did, what did you say about volume shadow copy there? They all rely on volume shadow copy. VSS. They all use that. Yeah, they all use volume shadow copy. So it's one of those services you think you can turn off that you don't need, but if you do it, then you'll break something. So. We used to go to that site, was it Black Viper that told all the services you could shut down to make Windows a lean, clean operating machine, but then nothing else would work? How much data are you imaging? I'll have to go back and look when it's finished. It's not that much. I don't know at that rate. I'm just surprised it takes this long. Well, I agree. 78%. There's, there's not a lot of data there. There might be, uh, off the top of my head, Maybe 100 gigs, maybe. I'll look when we get finished. It's one of those things I don't want to disturb while it's working. What'd you say, Joe? I was just thinking, I think, I think the, the, hundred, the transfer rate that they tell you there is how fast it pulls it off the NVMe drive. And then you got to wait until it gets it on the rotating drive. That's where the slow stuff goes. Yeah. But it's well within the uh, acceptability that this doesn't take too long. It's worth the wait. Well, Gil, that brings me to the point I was going to make a minute ago. Yes, sir. Just a, a work process that I use, uh, and you might benefit from it. What's that? Um, I use Bandicut because my video editing is very trivial compared to yours. But my, the output of Bandicut is always to my SSD because I've got uh, the C drive has almost nothing on it, so there's actually quite a bit of space yes. uh, there that I can put data on. So the only thing I do that takes time is video editing. So I always output to my fastest drive. Now, if you've got an NVMe drive there, it'd be even faster than an SSD. I would just suggest that you do the same thing, that you always put your output there. Now, that will really only benefit you if you do something more than once. So if I'm... Uh, uh, you know, taking uh, commercials out or something like that, uh, or you know, anything that that um, are going to end up joining things that are not from the same file. Well, that's more than one pass. So if I'm going to do take the commercial, well, let's just take a series of of things. Maybe I got five programs. I take the the um, commercials out of them and then I put them all together in a single file. That's the kind of thing I do. Uh, so I'm going to take one process, take the commercials out, and produce a file, and put it on my fastest drive, my SSD, your NVMe, and then do it again four more times. Now the source for the next thing that combines those five files into one is on your fastest drive. So uh, you only have to use a rotating drive once to get the things done. Hold that thought. Just finished. Image right. completed. Took, wow, 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Don't know why it took so long. That's an interesting lesson. I cloned faster than I could image. And it was to the same disk. Yes. That is very strange. Well, well it, it was from a different disk. Images got compression involved. True. Cloning does not compress. Now we'll look on the clone and image drive. There's everything. The G drive image is in that folder. And that folder is... Let's magnify again. The disk partition image says it's uh, about 73. I want to zoom back out because that's curious. I didn't remember that being that much. The data drive. Yeah, 
Use space 71.8 gigs. Well, it created an image a whole lot faster than I could just copy the data over. 71.8 gigs Yeah. versus, <laughs> it made a bigger file. <laughs> I hadn't paid attention to that. So well, the first process was from your NVMe to a rotating disk, and yes. the second process was from a rotating disk to a rotating disk. Yes. So that's part of what took it longer. So there's a total of 112 gigs on there. I thought there's about 100, so I wasn't far off, 112 gigs. Not bad. Lou will eventually fill up that clone and image drive, but uh, right now she's all set to go. Now, not yes, she, Now that she only backs up every four years. <laughs> 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 We've got a little distance here for us. Y'all been to Costco lately? No. Okay, I went to Costco probably, uh, let's see, today is Wednesday, Monday. A couple of new items. There's a laptop they've got that looks like a really good deal. Let's get that up on screen. Thank you. Remember, Lou, program is on the, preview is on the other side. Okay, you're doing good. Thanks, Greg. Lou Warren and uh, Greg, with his help, are running the switch today. Uh, and by the way, any questions anybody ever has, we don't always have that solution for it, but problems are how we learn because when there's something wrong, we try to fix it. It's nice to know about somebody else's problems because if somebody else is having it, I don't want to have it, but if I do, I want a solution for it. So if anybody else has some questions, email us. You can contact us on YouTube, and uh, we'll try to answer them. Uh, but anyway, the reason I was mentioning Costco, because this issue of getting data to a drive like doing video, as a video editing machine, building a Ryzen, which is what I'm going to use it for. That's why I tried to buy the drives we heard about a couple of weeks ago from, uh, I believe it was uh, Newegg, and they had a one terabyte Samsung for $200. That's $50 off. That was a deal. I was going to use that as a scratch drive to do the video editing on. Now, the NVMe drive is the boot drive, and it'd be ideal to do that. But as fast as it is to do that, to copy the data over to it, my ultimate goal is to be able to take something like an SSD because we have, we have a recorder up here that can do two things. We can capture the program as we're doing it now live, but we can also use this recorder, this SSD recorder, to play back clips, whether it's pre-recorded or something we've just recorded for a playback. What I would like is the ability to have access to these disks. To have access to these disks, I have to have the ability to use a device that we use USB 3.1C. So another reason for the new machines is having access to that USB 3.1C, either through a docking station or some way to, to manipulate all this stuff. And once the editing's done, off to a spinning drive. So the reason I mention this, SanDisk had an uh, external SSD, USB 3.1. And I want to say the price was like, was it $150? Do you remember, Mom? Oh, by the way, Mom had a birthday. I want to thank everybody for signing the card last week. Mom's birthday was May the 5th. Happy birthday, Mom. Seek of the mile, huh? And anybody else have a birthday coming up, be sure and let Lou know. That's another reason she's got to get this machine up and running, because that's the one she creates the cards on. So uh, anyway, I think it was about $150. We can look at Costco. Uh, does, does it show? What? Oh, I thought you were looking. No, no, I'm looking. For looking at something else. else. Okay, uh, USB 3.1, and it was a uh, SanDisk SSD. Now the transfer rate wasn't great, but the transfer rate was faster than if it was on a uh, spinning drive. We're going to be seeing more of USB 3.1 stuff coming out. That's the first one I've seen in a place. Mass mass merchandising, we'll call it. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I didn't buy one thinking about it. I'd like to try one just to see what kind of process we have. But the SSDs that we're using here at the meeting are a standard SSD. Uh, the drive has very specific uh, format requirements to record the video that we're doing. So that's my process I want to go to, to be able to plug a cable out of that drive or to a docking station into the computer and directly access the files on that disk. So that when I'm through editing, the file then can be offloaded to a regular hard drive. So it's not an NVMe drive, but it is a fairly fast SSD. 
so I, I would love for them all to be NVMe drives, and maybe we get to that point with an interface. But we're not even USB 3.1C yet for everything, so we're, it's a work in progress. But I'm going to try what you said, because I think yeah, it's a great Yeah, three-fourths of your C drive uh, is just sitting there. You might as well put some interim video on it. I do have the ability to put on this motherboard another NVMe drive. And uh, now that you've put the bug in my ear, it's going to be like a little voice saying, Gil, you need to listen to what Robert said. Because there's other things you said where I said I need to heed that wisdom. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Because now you got me curious. When you're cutting video, that's one thing. It's really fast. But when you're editing video and you've got a render, that rendering is just processing power, sheer processing power. And I'm, I'm curious to see how once we get further into this video, how fast that's going to go on a rise. If you put it on your fastest drive during the cutting process, then it's all set to go when you do the rendering. You know, it's not a separate process to get it there. Well, just the little clip that we did for Clifford Carley, which was two weeks ago, which I did in advance, by the time I hit enter and blinked, it was done. That's the fastest cut I've ever had. Couldn't believe it. And that was only about a three to six minute video. Did you have a comment, Clifford? Yeah, and uh, did you, have you needed it? Have you used it yet? It's there if you ever do, and if you need some more, let me know. We'll get some more footage going. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Robert. Okay, I'm going to show you some stuff with the Windows Creators Update that's kind of uh, interesting, a little bit annoying, but it's kind of an aha moment when you realize it's not that big a deal. Uh, anybody do any audio capturing with... Uh, What's that free program we all like with Audacity? It's real easy with Windows 7, um, yeah, with Windows 7, starting with Vista 7, 8, and with uh, Windows 10, but there's a little gotcha with Windows 10 Creators Update. So what I'm going to do is uh, go to a machine, and I'm going to be off the switch for just a minute, so you're totally using the switch. And what I'm going to do is let's go to this computer, which is number 2. And I'm going to go to the control panel. Number two, thank you. And you know when you install Audacity, you have to go to sound. And in the past, we had to turn on, say, show disabled devices. So we show disabled devices. Well, in, in Windows uh, Creators Update, show disabled devices is already showing. But the key is going over to recording, showing disabled devices. And normally, when you have speakers plugged in, you would have an icon there about the speakers that you would say, enable that device. And that was the device you had to have to make Audacity work. Now, it doesn't show here because I don't have speakers plugged in, and I can't, I can't do that. But if you go to Windows Creators Update, and you have speakers plugged in, there's no speaker icon there. You'll get all these devices for your sound card, on board, whatever, and for your video, for HDMI and all that stuff. But there's nothing there to make that work. There's a setting in Audacity you have to change to use the, I believe it's called Wasabi. Let's go over to the Ryzen machine just a minute. And I'm going to see, I think we've got Ryzen on this machine. I mean, yeah, we have a Ryzen processor. I think I have Audacity in here. Yep, there's Audacity. I've already configured it, but I'm going to show you the setting that had to be changed. And we're going to go to the, uh, I believe it was View Preferences, or was it Edit? Edit Preferences, which is Control P. Edit Preferences. And right here, I had to change the device to the Windows Wasapi. By default, it said MME. Now, I'm going to magnify this. The setting we used to change in Windows, you no longer have to do. This is what you have to change. By default, it'll say Windows MME, and it'll show the device, which we're on a DAC 70. Normally, it'll probably say uh, either Microsoft Sound Map or it'll have your uh, speakers listed here. So you change that to Windows Wasapi, and then you show your device and your loopback should be your speakers, two-channel stereo. Now, for this to work, you will record when you hear something.
when there's no sound, it will not do anything. But that one little change, Windows Wasapi, took care of the problem. I'm going to cancel this because I don't need to do anything. And I've already tested it, so I know it works. Um, and I can show you. But I did it with uh, Pat Spiana from uh, her website. Pat Spiana, which is on YouTube. And I'm able to record audio now, like we did before. But we don't make that change setting in Windows under sounds, under recording. We make that change under Audacity. And it, for that process, still works as before. Uh, something else that I didn't like that I found kind of curious, and I'm going to go back over to this machine again. Thank you. Uh, when we went to the display settings, I have no way to set the fonts. We've talked about this in the past. Now, right now, it has the size of text apps and other items at 100%. I can change this to a percentage-wise, but I still don't have the granularity to change the fonts like I did before. I didn't like that. So that's two things I found that are different. We'll go back up here to the home setting. And there was something else I wanted to show you. Have you ever guys, have any of you guys ever looked at this gaming thing? There's a game bar you can open, but you've got to log into the Microsoft site with your account. But if you use the game bar, you can do things besides games, but that's what it's geared for. Game DVR, and you can't, you can't set the folder until you can get the program up, which is kind of crazy, but I should be able to set it from here. You can broadcast. It's got a default broadcasting in the game mode. And you can use game mode by bringing a game board. I think the key is Win G. So if I did the Win G flag, it'll bring up and it says, do you want to open game bar? And I can say, yes, this is a game, or no, I don't, so that you can capture it. I just find that kind of curious. Also, there is a tips app. Have you all ever seen the tips, the Windows tips? See, the Windows tips, I don't want to search the web. Okay, trip, tips, trusted Windows Store app. Now, a lot of this is, uh, and the reason I stumbled into this, there was a, uh, does anybody use any Corel products? You know, we talked before about, okay, do you use Corel Draw, David, or do you use Corel, uh, Word Corel Word Perfect? That's ironic. So you do work with attorneys. Yeah, that's what they like. I've got a mail merge I've got to do for an attorney, so I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, there was a, uh, an email recently from Corel for the uh, PaintShop Pro that if you bought this version of PaintShop Pro, which cut into the chase, you buy this Wacom tablet and they give you PaintShop Pro. If you've got a tablet, what I'm showing you with tips, what comes up right now is kind of interesting because it's all about that. Make your paintings pop, draw on your docks over the rainbow. And if you click on the one for movies, it'll take you to a web page that'll show you trailers. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to get any copyright issues. And then they'll show you where you can click on a link and pay to see the videos. Do they give you copyright problems for trailers? Because that's their form of their advertising. Uh, we shouldn't, but we had a copyright issue when we played the uh, Intel video from, with the NFL from their game. All we were doing was looking at the drones. Yeah. But I guess because uh, a star was in it. We had a copyright issue. And when we showed the uh, formats, when we were changing from MP4 to MKV, we had a copyright infringement on that too, which I thought was annoying. In the future, just to let you all know, hang on a second, I'm going to have the ability that when we do something like that, I will hit a, uh, a still store on a frame that will show that frame so the people on YouTube will see something and hear something. They'll hear us talk, but they won't be able to see the video that we're seeing here but I don't have that capability right now. John Lum, uh, yeah, I mean, going, uh, John. Going back to Audacity a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the name of that patch that allows you to run MP3 on it? Uh, the patch that runs MP3. Let me, let me bring up the program and I'll tell or, you. Or a small program. Yeah, it's a lame. lame. Lame encoder. Lame. Let me go back over to this machine. I'll bring it up. Okay, I'll bring up. 
<laughs> Audacity. Yeah, it's yeah. lame. L A M E. And we do the edit preferences. What's nice, what I'm going to show you is how to get it. Libraries, MP3 library, and the lame MP3 library. And again, this is a copyright issue. This is going to take us to a link within the program that will put us on a web page. It takes us to Audacity, and Audacity then will take us or tell us about another web page. We're going to click on lame MP3. It'll load the browser. <coughs> take us to their website. Let me zoom out for just a minute. And we're on that page about the lame MP3 and also the FFmpeg import export library. See lame installation section. So I'll click on that. Go to the external lame download page. I'll click on that. And right there it is. That's lame. Lame is so much easier to deal with now than it used to be. Used to, when you downloaded Lame, you had to pull that DLL and pull it, put it somewhere. Now when you download Lame, this is an executable that you just uh, download it, execute it, it puts it in a directory, then you go tell Audacity to find it, and it's just one, two, three. So I'm going to click download it, and you'll see it's Lame version 3.99.3 .3 for windows.exe. So I'll save the file, go back up here to the top of the bar, get all the way over here. There's the file. Can we get a mic on uh, Jack so we can hear him please? Yeah. Thanks Robert. Scroll down a bit on that other page. There was something about a newer version for Audacity. Did you pick up on that? Let me go back. We'll take a look at that. 399.5, I think it said, or something like that. We'll go back. Yeah, right there, the bottom, bottom line that you can see there under zip option. Yes. If you need a newer version of Lang, here it is. Known to work with Audacity 2X. You can also find 398.2 that works with 1.3. So if you want the latest version, it's a zip file. It's not going to automatically put it where you want it. You're going to have to put it where it goes. Up here, open the folder. Now, this lane will do an auto install. The other lane, you've got to put it where it needs to go. But all you've got to have is a DLL. Yes, Robert? I know you've uh, got lots of spare time. I'm always looking for something else to do. Absolutely. But uh, Audacity comes up about once a year. And if you could just write this stuff down, but uh, titled by you know Windows 10 or whatever it is that's made the change, you don't have to do it once. And you could just click. I've got the link right there. And it just tells you instead of having to try to remember it each time and, and go through it again in real time. Because this is a repeating topic. About, about uh, Audacity? Yes, Audacity is what I'm talking about. I agree. I agree. It's, uh, Audacity is a great program. I can demonstrate to you SoundForge. I can demonstrate to you uh, oh, a couple other applications that do some amazing things. But for most people, for example, I wish Jim was here. I hope he's all right. But for Pat's piano, she wants to take from her videos and she wants to create an audio CD. That's easy to do. There's a number of ways to do it. I can take every one of those videos, drop it, drag it, and drop it, a video, on Audacity, and the audio is there, and then just save it out. Just that simple. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's, it's, and once I save it out, one, two, three, four of the tracks, then use an application to create a Red Book Audio CD like she wants. I'll do that when I get finished. But uh, to do what you're talking about with this, the process could change. For example, let's go back to this computer. Lame 3995. If I open this file, that's all I need is that DLL right there. It's a newer version. It's uh, shrunk. So uh, because I've already installed it, give me just a second. I think that is an x86. I'm going to bring up another Windows Explorer. I'm going to go to this PC. I'm going to go look on this C drive. I'm going to look under Program Files x86. 
and there's lame for audacity, and there's the lame DLL. So this is a straightforward process. That's all I need is to copy that over. Now that DLL is from 2011, so I can take this one, copy. I can leave the old one by doing F2 home, put an X in front of it or whatever. Yep, I need permission. I give permission. And just do a right click paste. And yes, you have administrator rights. So let's do it. And there's the new DLL from 5, 10, 2017, which is today. So, so if you install the old version, it, it writes the directory for you. And then you can do what I did for the new version and just find that folder and put that <laughs> DLL in there. Or you can overwrite the old one if you want. Doesn't matter. And there's an uninstall routine for it. But yeah. yeah, this thing with Audacity is going to come up again. Somebody had a question? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, Greg. Uh, you mentioned a while back about emailing us. Emailing. Yeah, but where do you email? When I look at the contact us on here, it just takes me to an older version of the Builder by website. Use the, uh, either use the, the Fairhaven UMC address. Believe me, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that website. A lot of work. I this, just, I this, just thinking we need to, you know, have something under contact us. I'll I'll fix that. Fairhaven. John, John Lum. Fairhaven UMC Fair, at Fair. builderby.net. I'll John. I'll get something up there. The concern about putting something on the website because there's been issues with spam. For example, we're builder by. You would not believe the stuff we get from vendors like from China who have LEDs or uh, stuff that deals with valves and bushings. Uh, I mean, just. And then we get some folks that talk to us about the old pages, and I have to go through this spiel of telling That's them, look, the website is talking points. Pages get updated accordingly as we talk about that particular topic. If we don't revisit that topic, then I'm not updating the web page. Okay. Because it's 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 resources, but I'll 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 do what you asked. Another issue is about doing spam, uh, putting up a uh, email address that machines can't see, but if people click on it, will work. So I'll I appreciate you mentioning that, Greg. I'll I'll do that. When I put this shell up, I thought I was going to keep using this program. When I started using this program, I could do a web page in two hours. Now it's taking five. And I'm trying to figure out where the snag's at. Um, I have an idea what it is, but I am just real close to trying to find a different program. I love this program based on results, but I don't like working with the program because it's, it's just really, really slow. It creates a database. And every time I create a file, it writes that database. Then I preview that database. Then I export. It doesn't export the changes, it re-exports everything. So it's, uh, I don't think the program is made to be used for something that has a lot of pages. And I'm not interested in a database program for doing that kind of stuff because that opens up other security issues. I want straight HTML pages and I want to keep it simple. I like a page that resizes, so does Google, that resizes according to the display. Builder will do that. Another comment? Not? Okay. Good point though, Gray. I'll, I'll work on it. Let's see now. Uh, we got through the uh, stuff on Audacity, and I know this is going to come up again, and I'm sure we'll be doing it again. Let me zoom back out on that. Audacity is just a wonderful program, easy to use. And now that you know how to configure it, edit, preferences, Devices, Wasapi. Wasapi and your device will probably be your speakers, and your recording device, again, will be your speakers. For us, it happens to be a DAC 70 because we've got our HDMI, so we have, anyway, it goes through the converters. You get the stuff up on screen to make the magic happen. And I'll close that as well. I gotta share this with you because I found it a little bit annoying. Anybody that's got, and this goes back to cloning and imaging, Anybody that's got Windows installed or you're going to build a new machine, get the current version of Windows in there and do it before the creator's update comes out. 
and get it activated. And here's why. I activated this machine and I thought I activated it with Windows 10. Apparently I didn't activate until I had put in Creator's Update. Because of the problem I have with the power supply and I couldn't get some stuff fixed, I reformatted the drive. When I went back to reinstall Windows 10, it would not activate. It said the key had already been used. So I had to use a different key. That just really annoyed me. Now, on two fronts, I could have used, I could have waited six months so I could reuse the key, or I could have waited three months when they fixed the bugs with Creator's Update. So I just cut to the chase and used another key since I have keys left over from the old days. I used a key from, uh, again, 2012. So I've got Lou back up and running. Not on her original key, but on one of my keys. But when this first came up, d d how many of y'all use your uh, desktop icons? Who's doing that? Thank you. you desktop yeah. icon. Yeah, desktop icons. I, I do too. I like those up there because there's certain things. For example, the control oh. panel in the creator's update, you can't right-click the menu and get control panel unless you've installed another application. So if you don't have it here, you've got to go search control panel each and every time. If Windows is not activated, there's a nag screen that sits in front of everything on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And it will blow out, after a certain period of time, all those desktop icons. What it doesn't affect, because it's not there by default, is your toolbar, if you know how to get the quick launch toolbar back in. Everything with that still shows. But it took away all the desktop icons. My first thought was, this sucks. My second thought was, well, that's a pretty neat idea. Because no matter what I put on the desktop, I'm not going to see it. Keeps it clean. Because I typically have the desktop stuff and I put it somewhere else. And for Lou's machine, I've got it set for the view to uh, her desktop icons and her, and her gadgets. I've got gadgets on here. Because, again, I like to know what's going on with a processor and for as many cores as there are in there. And this is resized according to the display. So I gotta resize it again. When we put it on her monitor, it'll it'll change again. But there's eight cores, sixteen threads. I just I like to see that. And depending on what we're running, I like to see it because I like to know what's going on. Now, I told you about that little program that was causing noise. That's the gadget. Network monitor. The only thing I ever do with network monitor is I change the size because it does an auto scale. But I think it's on like number three or four. Number four, human voices. All these were checked, play a sound. Play a sound when the lost internet. Play a sound when internet connection established. Play a sound when lost network connection. Play a sound when network connection fixed. That is where that woman's voice was coming from that would wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. When Windows rebooted, I thought it was Killer Networks. This is what was doing it. It's one of those aha moments. So I had to share that with you. And that's not the default. But the network monitor, too, I like the information I get out of that. I just didn't care for the voice. So instead of muting the computer, I turned those voices off. I can tell you about that. Uh, no, I have not, and I'm glad you mentioned that because when I was having trouble on Lou's machine with her power supply, I was trying to figure out what was wrong, and there was a suggestion uh, of uh, four or five different things to do, and one of them was the power supply. And when I realized what they were talking about, and I had that stare me in the face, uh, a pause.com fix the driver. WDRD, WWDFRD, failed to load to the device event ID 219. It's number 41 on the talking points. I believe number five down there was a failing power supply. Uh, but in this, there is also a discussion about using a monitor that you mentioned. And I have a link up on that as well in one of these. It is speed fan, access temperature sensor in your computer. If you're getting too much heat, like Joe said, heat is an issue, and that is probably what was causing problems for uh, John Lum. This monitor is another way to check those temps. 
You know, I always thought we wanted to check the temps to see what's going on with the CPU, make sure I've got enough fans, or to check the uh, video card to make sure it's staying cool. I never really thought about making sure that the uh, power supply was staying cool. But I do know the noise problem I had, and even some static on the audio, was caused by a bad power supply, which eventually the cascading failure with RAM caused other problems. Dwayne? On the heat issue, I've got a, I don't know, six or seven year old Dell XPS, and I was having that problem and I was continually monitoring the, uh, the temperature because it was going up and overheating and sometimes shutting off. And so I employed a technique suggested on the web of removing the battery. Oh. And so, because I just use the computer plugged in on my lap and I've been doing it now for six or eight months. The temperature stays down and I've had it, but you're, it has some portables these days. The, the power runs through the battery so you can't actually take the battery out. And you know, and you used to a lot of the laptops when we'd have a problem, that was one of the suggestions to kill the power was to pull the battery so that you could kill the power completely to get the computer to reset. With the new computers, like with Nick's treaters, the battery is built into that rascal. You cannot take that battery out. But he gets a long life on it. So these batteries, that's something to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. And that laptop that Nick's treater, Blue Warren, and Andrew got from Costco, that model is no longer available at Costco. The secondary model that did not have the NVMe drive is also gone from Costco. There is a version of it on Amazon, but it's not the same deal. Now, there are some Asus laptops at Costco, but not that Asus Zen laptop. So anybody got one of those? I think you got a great machine. But this issue with keeping a machine cool, i am not been a big fan of, of water-cooled, but because of what I've done now that Ray Morris has been doing for over two years in this Corsair case with a Corsair cooler on this uh, Ryzen uh, 1800X, I'm intrigued by it. So just like you found that laptop that had a cooler on it, anything that can make that sucker run quiet, I'm really interested in. If it's got liquid cooler in it, because I think they're at a point now where they can keep things from leaking, uh, the horror stories I used to hear, without having to spend a ton of money, I'm, I'm very, very interested in. Robert. When you're rendering for 30 minutes, do you see a temperature change uh, with your new Ryzen machine? Well, no, that's interesting. There are three profiles that I can run, and I'm running in the power efficiency profile, and I have not had any kind of heat problems. And I'm running with the video that I'm doing in the most efficient power usage, which is the quiet. Well, I'm not quiet. suggesting that you might have a problem. I'm just curious if you can, you know, you can look at your gadgets, you can, you can see uh, your processor's busy. Yeah, so, okay, well, I'm, I'm getting paid or pay back for all the money you put into it, but uh, it's been sitting there at 30 degrees. Does it run up to 45 when this happens, or does it sit there in 30 and still just moving along peacefully? I need to do what you suggested, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. It's something I definitely want to look into. I've been watching the cores to see what I'm doing. But I haven't watched the temperatures yet, but that's the next step. Well, years ago, I tried to run Prime 95, and it would run about five seconds, and then boop, <laughs> shut my machine down. Uh, but that was back when I was having the thermal problems. Yeah, and see, that's interesting, because usually a thermal problem, we had problems with the thermistors on the CPUs. Uh, you know, some of the heat issues we've had in the past, you can't take anything for granted. And... Building a new machine, if you're going to build a new machine, build a new machine. A power supply for $110. You know, I remember used to when we'd spend $300 on a power supply. But we don't have to do that now. Well, I was just trying to, to remember what it was. And I remember now, uh, six months or so ago, I found out why that machine was overheating. It was because the processor fan was clogged up with cat hair. Wow. And since I didn't discover that six or seven years ago, I went and built a new machine. It'll do it. It doesn't overheat. The new one, it does just fine. Funny how that works. Okay, let's go back over the talking points. Uh, I mentioned about this program to uh, speed fan to watch the temperature. I haven't had a chance to use it yet, but it's something I'm going to look into. Thank you. 
Now, I mentioned to you about the Asus Zen here, talking point number 38. There's one on Amazon. Uh, pros and cons of it, it's close, but it's not exactly the same machine. It's also more money. And I've got a link up here on some stuff from Red Shark. If you want to read what Canon's doing, that's more of a, it's not an actual article of what Canon's doing. It's a, uh, it's like getting inside somebody's head and they're making a forecast on what they perceive Canon is going to do based on what Canon has done. Uh, time will tell how that plays out. But they've got another article up on Red Shark about HDR and talks about deconfusing the standards. So if you're interested in HDR, it's something to take a look at. Oh, and something back at Costco. Those, uh, those new uh, QLED TVs from Samsung, when we were there Monday, they were setting them up. So they're not only on the website, but they've now got them in the store. And they had a bunch of them. They're planning on selling a bunch. At that price, if they're cheaper by the dozen, I'll take number 12. Costco. Costco, Costco the Samsung QLED. It was, uh, I believe, just under $4,000. So when you get ready to go get one, Nick, I'll tag along. Pick us up both of them, Nick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, if they're cheaper by the dozen, I'll take number 12. Okay, back over to the talking points. I've got some stuff up here about radiators. Since I had links up last week from e EKWB, EKWB.com, they've got now a blog talking about radiators. Uh, the size, and uh, it's an interesting read. Now, there was a couple of things. If you're a photographer, you're into sliders, but I've got one article here about a, a device for backing up media, and this is on Cinema 5D, talking point number 33. You can take a look at it. This is a device, and we, we can go to it. It doesn't matter. We won't, we won't get into copyright issues. This is a device somebody was showing at NAB that allows you to take your media from your camera and make a backup copy of it without a computer, which I thought was kind of a neat idea. I don't know what the price of the device is, but I find it very fascinating. Something else that came out of NAB was 8K. Y'all know the first movie now that's 8K? It is the, uh, well, let's see, I had a link up here for it. The, uh, the Galaxy, the... Uh, Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy Guardians two. of the Galaxy number two. Guardians of the Galaxy number two is going to be an 8K. 27 of the talking points. There it is. Thank you. And they're using a red weapon 8K. The red camera is like a $50,000 camera plus the lens plus all the other stuff. So if you ever see anything about a red camera, there's a $30,000 version and a $50,000 version. It's an expensive camera, and that's what they're using. I've also got a link up to a new video that, uh, on YouTube that Lindsey Sterling has. You can play it at your leisure because I don't know what issues would be with copyright. I'm not going to click on it. Don't want to get into it. I've got a link up on the uh, security flaw we talked about with Intel. You can read more about it. And there was an interesting article that uh, Dwayne sent from Ars Technica, talking point number 24, about the next step for ISP Wi-Fi. Uh, that's an interesting read. There's a lot of ways to look at it. And what it amounts to is who's responsible for your Wi-Fi, your ISP or you? Personally, I take, I take that on myself that if I'm going to do my network, then I'm in charge of the network. Just like what we have to have, a, we have a separate network here, a sub-network, to run the video switch so that Lou can run it, or I can run it here, or, or uh, one of these days I'm going to talk you into it, Andrew, running the switch, or if uh, Ben is going to run the switch. We have a separate network from the network you guys plug into. Uh, based on what that is saying, uh, Comcast apparently has bought a company that once they do the firmware update, they will be able to deploy devices within your house for a fee that will broaden your network. But that means that, and it also has telemetry where they can work on it without coming out to work on it. What was your take on it, Dwayne? No comment? You liked it? Where's the mics? Oh, thanks. I've been listening to a lot to uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, and he's, he's a big fan of plume, which is, and I forgot the terminology they use for this new Wi-Fi networking where you have multiple units, you sell it in uh, 
typ a typical house is going to have at least two or three devices as opposed to the single router that many of us are accustomed to. But it sets up an independent unit in each room and it gets far better coverage. So uh, sounds like an awfully good idea. Uh, My concern is, is based on what Comcast has done to piggyback network access for everybody on our systems, you know they'll do it on this. Well, that's right. But the, the answer, I don't know, the answer is, you know, it's fine for us to say, hey, I want to go in and play it. I want to buy my high-powered router, router and I want to do all this. I mean, most people don't even know what they have. They don't even know whether that device is a modem, a modem and a router. You're right. Wh whatever. So for them, I think it will be a chance to get better coverage because these Wi-Fi extenders that we, we often use are not often a very good choice. They're and I, th I think this plume will provide for the average user an opportunity to get better Wi-Fi coverage. Of course, they'll pay for it, but uh, Did you they know. give any idea for deployment when it's set to, to No, they, it's kind of one of these things. They've just struck the deal with Plume, and it's going to be a, you know, a tech, technological challenge because they're going to have to redo their modem router to be able to use the Plume technology. So I would suspect it, you know, it's sometime down the line. Maybe within a year. Yeah. Year or two. It's, it's again a technology to watch, something to be aware of. I appreciate you sharing it. I've got another article up here on uh, the Surface uh, TechNet, Tech Connect on number 19. Uh, Dwayne, how far along are you on your laptop search? You were considering a Dell. Have you gotten there yet? Bless you. I, I still have this 4K Envy. I don't know why. Uh, it just seems like if. If I'm, I've got a, you know, I've got a full HD in my old existing laptop, why go if I'm not going to go that high? And I'm just, but I'm deciding whether I really need it or want it. And the Dell clearly is, is I think, the best machine. For what you, for what you want. For what I want. But I think with, with the, the liquid cooling concept, Right now, what I'm going to do is wait and see if that takes over. I mean, if this technology works, one would expect the implementation by a lot of different vendors. And, you know, who knows? It may take off. Tommy, take care. Thanks for coming. Or it may not. You know, the only other thing I've considered is, is you know, the two-in-one, the HP Spectre, which is a cheaper, doesn't have quite as advanced technology, but allows you to use the tablet, although I think the real answer is I never use it as a tablet anyway, so. Is that the one that's a tablet that you magnetically attach the keyboard to? No, this, it, it folds. Folds up. It folds up. It's not detachable. Interesting. But it is a really good system at a, at a reasonable price, but it, it doesn't have as high a, high a technology as the Dell. So are you ready to pull that trigger yet, or are you like... I, I'm, I think, well, the answer is why. I have a com laptop that works perfectly well. I have no reason to get another one except I want one. So it's, so, not, a, it's not a need right now like John Lum. Yours is a want. Well, mine is a want. The question and, is, is this a feature or is this a benefit? Right. So. And I, I think the, the liquid cooling has kind of put me on hold until I determine whether or not that's going to be a, a feature in the new system. There's got to be somebody else coming out with liquid cooling. I agree. I think so. There, there has to be. I mean, this is, it's getting where now it, it's viable. It's doable without about, the rest. How about you, Joe? Have you, are you anywhere on your search? You know, I, I'm, I'm drawing up a list of things I want on it. But I'm like you. I, I, I don't have the motivation to really look because... This thing has been rock solid for eight years. You definitely got your money's yeah. worth out of it. Yeah, me too. Oh, it, yeah. It, you know, once I put in the SSD, once I replaced <laughs> yeah. the, the hard drive with an SSD, this Dell is, is more than fast enough for, 
for the, what I'm using it for. I put an SSD in here too. So. I took an older machine that was SATA 2 that I bring up here sometimes that I work on the network with. I put an SSD in there. Man, did I breathe new life into that computer. And it was the first computer that had USB 3.0. So once you've had an SSD, that's one thing you just don't want to go back on. See, this is older than 3.0. This does not have 3.0. USB 2. Yeah, yeah, USB my, mine's 2. modern. I've got USB 3.0 too. So I mean, <laughs> well, what how, do I need? How new is your laptop? It's about six or seven years. It's a Dell XPS, which was there top of the line at the time, which had the latest technology. So you're getting your money's worth out of it? I am, I certainly am. That's something to think about. What'd you have, 16 gigs of RAM or eight? Don't remember? I know exactly. I have six, because that was the default. Wow. And I've never <laughs> needed any more than that, because I, I have, you know, I have, I have a desktop, so if I yeah. want to do Photoshop or something like that, I, I've got an i7 with 16 gig on it. You've got it for the power. Yeah. Something to think about. How well, many slots does your laptop have inside? Three? Three, three, car, three slots only? Memory slots? No, two. So if I went up to eight, I'd have to take out. Oh, so you got a two and a one in there. Yeah. No, two and a one. No, I got a, what, it would be four and a two. A four and a two then? Yeah. But yeah, so, so I could upgrade, I keep, yeah. but you know, when I think about upgrading. It's one what? stick, it's no big deal. No big deal, <laughs> but why, why bother? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I get it really, and then, and the, you know, the, I guess the only other thing I could do if I wanted to take the DVD out, I could, but I don't need the space because I got a 256 uh, SSD and I, don't ever use, utilize that, so there's really no, nothing. It just keeps on keeping on. What do you do mostly with it? Email? Surf do the web? Email, surf the web, you know, mild, Lightroom, you know, minimum photo touching and stuff like that. Uh, nothing, nothing that we require. You know, the, probably the most taxing thing is, you know, a Z and tabs in Chrome. Which, I hear you. Got, which fills up the memory, but uh, that's really the most taxing thing I do on that machine. Lots of disk swapping does the does the job. Yeah. I think that about wraps it. Does anybody have any more questions or comments? Now remember, oh yes, Jack. Let's get a mic on Jack over here. Yes, Jack. Uh, question. Is yes, any, Jack. Has anybody ever dealt with? Uh, hang on, let me look up the name of it here. Blonde or brunette? <laughs> I wish. This is a vendor we're looking at? Yeah, it's Echo and uh, something. Echo and Optics. Echo and Optics. Is the name of it, yeah. What do they have? Well, I ran TVs. Oh. Uh, electronics, uh, amplifiers, receivers, uh, yada, yada. I never even heard of it. Well, I hadn't either. I ran across them in a mention on, um, on eBay, and they had some favorable comments on uh, AVS forum also. And uh, uh, they're like 10% uh, was a lot of the things I've been looking at, which is high-end TVs, they're like 10% below Amazon prices. Well, I pull up their website, and all I get is a, a salmon-colored web page. There's nothing there. There's no text. Uh, I don't know how I got to it, but I pulled up a website and was able to shop on it. Yeah, I right hear. Ah, uh, Echo and Optics. I took the A out. Echo and Optics. So that was some of bars. I've seen no no bad comments about them and only good comments, but I'd like to know somebody that had dealt with them personally. <laughs> Is it ECO? E E C O, E C H O. E C H O. Echo. And optics. And, and optics. A N D. Optics. A N D. Right. I just put echo and 
and the word optics, and it came up. <clears throat> they were selling the Sony uh, 940D or whatever their uh, got yeah. it good one is for like uh, got it 54 or something I think. I never heard of it. I'll do some looking into it. I want to email a page to myself. It's spelled just like it sounds. They sell clips. Where are they located? Can't tell you. Why not? Right. <laughs> That's a no. Actually, I looked it up, and I mean, it's in the U.S., but uh, I can't remember where it was. I would do a Who Is search. Let's do that right quick. Whenever I'm going to do business with somebody that's new that I don't know. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Do a who is search. And since we're not sure where they're at or who they're registered with, let's just do a simple who is search and it'll point us in a different location. Get all the good stuff off of here. Echooptics.com. Okay, their registration date was 2012. Not bad. They're on GoDaddy. Uh, we don't know where they're at because that shows Scottsdale, Arizona. That's not where they are. Yeah, they're just showing the default. Um, I would be a little bit concerned. Contacts, sales, nothing about location. Echo and optics. Sometimes you'll get a map over here about us. 30 years of experience on eBay. They may not have a store. I seriously doubt that they have a brick and mortar operation anywhere. Yeah, they're on Amazon. But neither does... Well, I guess Amazon does now with their fruit stands, but... <laughs> Echo and Optics storefront. Shipping information. If they're on Amazon, then that's how I'd buy from them. And it shows 100% uh, positive lifetime, eight total ratings. If I was going to buy from them personally, I would buy from them on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, their eBay rating was, uh, I think, 25,000 transactions or something, and they had 100% favorable. If they're good to go, and what are you looking to buy from them? Well, I'm shopping TV sets. My TV, my TV in my bedroom died last week. That's a good point. And, uh, uh, that's an opportunity to move the one from the living room into the bedroom and get a really big one for the living room. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Jim Johnson was looking at uh, from somebody online, and I think they were out of New York, somebody else that I hadn't heard of, but I think that they ended up going to Best Buy because his wife, Pat, liked Best Buy for whatever reason. I don't, but... I have my reasons why I wouldn't shop there. You couldn't pay me to shop there. I like Costco. I'm a fan. <clears throat> you could lock me up in there and I'd be happy. <laughs> All the berries and pineapple I can eat. Big a TV. I'm I, a slut. I go where the best price is. Well, <laughs> I like a good price, but I also consider service. Uh, some people were buying from Fry's at one time because of price, but I'm hearing Fry's is maybe not doing so well. So, Nick, isn't that where you bought yours at Fry's? The problem is Fry's because there's no sales tax. No sales tax at Fry's. <coughs> That's something to think about. Keep us posted on this uh, Echo and Optics and let us know what you decide. All right, what brand are you looking at? I'm sorry? What brand TV are you looking at? Uh, right now with Sony or Samsung. <laughs> or maybe LG? Uh, LG is, 
I, I don't know, they don't, don't turn me on on their LEDs. Their OLEDs are really nice, but out of my price range. Yep. I think we're having a little trouble with the light. That's why that keeps fuzzing out on us. There. That's better. Sorry about that. Thanks, Robert, for pointing that out. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, Jerry Lee was interested in that technology from LG at one time, but then he decided, okay, what am I really getting for the money? And so then he looked at Samsung like all the rest of us did. I used to be a Sony person. I've had Sony since as far back as I can remember. Mm -hmm. But after this last Sony, when I went looking at the Samsungs, I'm with where Nick Streeter, Joe, I'm a Samsung fan. I love our Samsung. I like the price on it too and the quality for what it does. The only thing I could say negative about it is periodically, because again, I leave it on all the time, because to, for me that's part of the test to see the, the uh, longevity of the product. Periodically, I have to turn it off because it will lose sync and you can't hit the remote button anymore uh, to adjust volume. It'll just, it'll lose it. You have to shut it down, power it back up. Hmm. Never had it. I never had that problem. Never have? I've never had it. Must be a Microsoft product, true. I've, I've never had that on a TV. Uh, the one Sony that we had last one, we got about an extra two years out of it because the problem that we started having, other people had two years prior to that, about that time. Any, any more questions from anybody? I think I'm done for the day. If you've got any questions, please be sure and let us know in advance. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. We appreciate your support. Uh, this is Builder Bob, where we talk about building, buying, upgrading computers. Windows, all that good stuff. Joe won't be here next week. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, oh, I thought you were no, going to. No, it's June. Everybody keeps telling me that. Oh, it's June. I'm t June 10th. I won't. It's after the day. I won't be here. Oh, cool. So you're, you're going to be here. Ben's going to be here next week. I'm a happy camper. We'll be here next week. You're going to be here next week? Okay. Thanks for coming, folks. Appreciate your support. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Okay. You're good to go. Okay. And we are signing off. <laughs>